afternoon, everyone. We're very happy to have you for our Women's Leadership Council, uh, Women in Leadership Speaker Series. And on behalf of the URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement and the Women's Leadership Council, I'd like to welcome you all. My name is Kira Mudd. I am an Alumni Engagement Assistant Director at URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement, and I serve as a staff liaison for the Women's Leadership Council. I'm honored to partner with uh, Women's Leadership Council for the Women in Leadership Speaker Series, which is a program that showcases the inspiring careers of highly successful and influential women and provides the opportunity to share their knowledge and experiences with students and alumni. This program is the first of the first series for this year, and I want to thank you for joining us and we hope you return for future speakers. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to highlight the Women's Leadership Council. Led by a group of alumni volunteers, the URI Women's Leadership Council supports and enhances the personal and professional growth of URI women by cultivating meaningful opportunities to unite, celebrate, empower, and learn from each other while forming lasting connections and relationships in the community and beyond. Additionally, the Women's Leadership Council supports and promotes the Women Transforming Women Endowed Scholarship, a scholarship that is awarded each year to a woman-identified student who holds a leadership position and maintains a GPA of at least a 3.0. Now, about today's program. This session will be question and answer style between our featured speaker, Michelle Edelman, class of 1989, and our moderator, Megan Mooney, class of 2006. While you're listening to the program, feel free to write your questions into the Q&A feature, and if time allows, we'll spend some time at the end to answer your questions. Please note that we may not be able to get to all questions today. Now, I'm excited to introduce our host, Megan Mooney. Rhode Island native Megan Mooney began working in the entertainment industry at age 10 when she landed roles in national commercials and as a kid reporter for a Saturday morning program on NBC. She went on to earn a degree in fashion marketing from URI's College of Business, where she currently serves as an advisory board member, followed by a career in New York City working for world-renowned publisher Condé Nast. In 2012, Megan won a TV competition to co-host a live talk show on CBS, which was just the beginning of an exciting and successful television career, hosting and producing shows in the nation's top markets, where she eventually became an Emmy Award-winning TV host. Today, Megan utilizes her people skills and design experience as a remodeling consultant outside Boston. Megan's also a children book author and designer with Style Starts With a Smile, and Tilly Tales, A Day at the Beach, available at local bookstores and Amazon. Megan, thank you so much for joining us today and for hosting this program. I'll now turn it over to you. Kara, thank you so much. I know we had some technical difficulties earlier on and um, you just jumped in there and um, wow, what, what a leader you are and you have done so much work on this. So thank you. Um, this is such a pleasure to be here, to be part with all the other women and maybe some men too who are watching, um, just to be able to you know, go from URI and then see all the progression um, and then see others and be able to talk about it together. It's pretty cool. So Michelle Edelman, she's here and she is the class of 1989. I can't wait to chat with you again, Michelle. I know we caught up a little bit like off camera a couple of weeks ago uh, before all the holidays. So I'm sure <clears throat> more stuff has gotten onto your plate, but, but welcome. You have such an accomplished career in, I mean, the media industry and the home entertainment industry, but kind of in the not the limelight, like all the streaming, the reason why we get all the video on demand that we have in our fingertips. So that's a lot. We'll get into it in a second. But first, can you just take us back to when you were at URI and, and kind of that journey and all the obstacles that you had to face before you became this executive that you are now? Yeah, it's been a it's been, you know, it's been a beautiful journey, I have to tell you. And I was thinking about it this morning and and just kind of, you know, how I'm how I'm gonna portray it. Um so I, uh, I I graduated high school and I chose URI um, and it was very specific of what I was looking for in a university and um, they gave me a, a, a really good opportunity. So I, um, you know, I showed up and I remember, you know, my mother passed away um, when I was a uh, sophomore in high school. So going to college was... Uh, was a big, you know, undertaking for me. I, I knew I was going to go, but I didn't realize what was going to happen when I got there. And then I was, uh, you know, still very much grieving as a as a teenager. 
And, and what I did is I found, I found my found family, my found family of, of sisters. Um, I joined a sorority. Those women are still in my life today um, in a very, very, uh, very special way. And I, I can't even um, tell you about the, the relationships that, that we have. We are, we are truly sisters of, of other mothers. Um, but I really learned how to think at URI. That was a, that was a big moment for me. Um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was lovely being in Rhode Island. I mean, we're, you know, one of the most beautiful states in the country. Um, and I really kind of just dug in and, and realized that this was the place I was going to start my journey. And it was the journey of, um, um, the next stage of, of my life. And I wanted to start in career. You know, a lot of people are like, I want to start family. I want to start travel. I really wanted that career. And it just seemed so exciting for me. I'm not sure why, you know, I, I grew up in New York and I was, um, my dad worked in the city and I was always around the city and in the city and it was part of my life. And I was like, I want to go back and I want to start a career in the city. I want to start a career in New York city. And that's what I did. Well, you like that fast paced lifestyle for sure. And, um, I mean, that, that's awesome just to jump yeah. into the career and just to build from there. Um, yeah. and I, you were from from a really great foundation. It sounds like that you started with URI. Well, now you work for a company in Los Angeles, California. You know, we're all jealous who's ever here in the Northeast. Uh, it's a company called Premier Digital. And yeah. so going to what I was saying before is, is, is what you're in. And you can tell us more for sure about that is um, just all of the background that has to happen in order for us to be able to see the home entertainment that you bring to us. Can you tell us about some of those um, that that journey? to get to the job that you are now at and, and, and what inspired you? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take you back and kind of how I actually got here. Um, so once, once I left school, I was in, um, I was working in New York. I actually got a job at Warner brothers in, in New York city at one of the divisions of Warner brothers, the studio that was the last one based in New York. Um, I, I got there a beautiful way. I got there through, um, through, you know, friends and family and I, and I, but, but I actually did a lot of, um, networking. I mean, even, at, even back then, and it was 19, you know, 89 and 90, I did networking. I did an internship. Uh, they always talk about internships. Internships are fantastic. It's a great way to really, you know, kind of get into a working world when you're, when you're still in a, when you're still a university student. Um, I did an internship and I worked my way up and, the division I was in, actually, um, I'll never forget, they they uh, kind of walked me into my boss's office and they're like, uh, congratulations on, on graduating from college and our gift to you is a job. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Um, and I got a job with, 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 the, with Warner, with the division I was in. And I worked there for um, for about four years. And that was, it was a television division. It was a division that um, I really... Um, and it was unique. It was interesting. They were doing back then what was then called pay-per-view. So they were licensing movies to cable operators for transactional um, transactional viewing. And the gentleman who uh, who ran the division was named Edward Blyer. And um, Edward Blyer just passed away. And it was a really, really, um, you know, he was he was in his nineties. And when I met him, he was he was in his sixties. Um, and he didn't seem that old, but he was, he was a mentor to me. And he was like a, he was like a father figure. He, um, he was such a smart businesswoman, um, excuse me, smart businessman. Um, he, he had his uh, career starting in like CBS and, and he used to tell me these great stories. He used to come in my office and say, Michelle, let me tell you about this. And let me tell you about that. And, and I really, really enjoyed his, his conversations. He, um, he gave me a small piece of that business and it was licensing movies. And I don't know, I just kind of enjoyed it. And, and every day would go by and I wouldn't even know what time of day it was. I just fell right into it. And it was, it was business related. And we were, and then they started letting me get involved in deals and they just sort of, um, you know, started giving me pieces of, of, of the work. And, but, you know, there was, it was a two way street. It was like, they were giving it to me because they felt I was capable of doing it. And, and I proved that to them. Um, and I, I followed people and I listened and I just took care of what needed to be taken care of. And, you know, I'm not going to say I did everything they told me to do because that would be, you know, that would be kind of off the charts, but, but I did the right thing. Um, and I also 
befriended a lot of people there too. And I, I made a lot of friends and I'm still friends with those executives today. Um, my, my first boss is now the mayor of Palm Springs. <laughs> so, you know, every, everyone sort of, you know, blossomed in their careers and went into, into, you know, either the same area or different areas. So I started at Warner um, and I surrounded myself with really good people. Um, I then, I got recruited by Disney. So I was in a, in an interesting, unique role and, um, and Disney called me and said, we, we'd like you to come do for us what you're doing for Warner right now. It was, it was this, it was one of these areas that was sort of blooming and it was, it was the, the kind of the precipice of technology and television. That's where it was. Um, Michelle, cut in just for one second, since I know we're going to finally get to where you are now. Um, yeah. and I love you in telling us this background. Sure. Because I think too, it's like what you were doing was it was in what the nineties, right? Because you graduated yeah. in the 80s. so yeah. when you look really on Wikipedia, it starts in like nineteen ninety two, where in like paper, yeah. and then you see it's just progressing, and yeah. then it it's like it's what fast years, moving like, industry, five. yeah, fast moving, and I'll, and I'll get to I'll get to where I am right now. Um, yeah, so, but so no, that, that was exciting during the nineties, like yeah. a lot of that, like because we didn't have all of these devices in front of us then you were creating way for us right. to get it we didn't have devices we had we had mechanisms it was called like store and forward and it was when cable was starting to to really grow and and multiple channels were starting to take off and you know i was a I wasn't, I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say I was a TV kid, but I loved movies. I loved the movies. I really did. And, and the fact that what I was trying to do or the group was trying to do was take those movies and bring them in home was so exciting. But I remember things not working all the time. I remember constantly we'd, we'd run into these scenarios where like we'd put out these great movies on pay-per-view and the, the revenue would come back really, really slim. And we're like, what happened? Like, oh yeah, we had an outage or, you know, one of the biggest cable systems. Um, another thing that I was really interested in was geography. I have this knack for maps. I don't know. It was just like, as a kid, I traveled around Europe, um, with my sorority sisters and I was like the map. They were like, we needed to go somewhere. So I, um, um, I started working on all these, um, these outlines of it, really interesting, like almost like engineering wise, um, technical capabilities around of cable systems around the country and who had capabilities to, to do this. So that was another little piece of the business, but it all had to do with how we were gonna get and how we were gonna transmit. Um, now I was working for a studio, but at that point in time, the studios and the cable operators were aligned. They all owned each other. And then over time, as the business kind of expanded, you know, there was like rights components where things couldn't be owned by certain um, certain providers and like studios couldn't own theaters. And there was just this, you know, monopolies. So um, so the business really evolved. Everyone bought everyone up um, or they got rid of them. The telephone companies came into the marketplace. I moved from Warner to Disney. The business started growing. Um, and then, uh, I started working in cable a bit. I went onto the cable network side because I had such an, a, an interest in it years back. So, so let me get to where I am now. So ironically, um, uh, when I left Warner, somebody said something really fantastic to me. It was my boss. He said, Michelle, sometimes you can leave the places you love, but you can always go back. There's no reason why. I mean, once you leave a place, <clears throat> Um, you can always go back. I mean, if there's if there's an opportunity for you, you can. And I did. I went back to Warner for almost another 20 years. Um, and that was in Los Angeles. And that was kind of the, the precipice of my career. And, and in that, um, I supported the team that was transitioning physical media to digital media. This was the real start of like, we were launching TV shows on iTunes. And when I say TV shows, I'm talking like the Flintstones. This was, in, this was probably 2008. Um, we launched the Flintstones. We launched Babylon Five. We launched. Um, oh but then, Michelle, like I remember watching Mad Men on iTunes in like what was it, two thousand nine? It's like yeah. that's how Flintstones. Yeah, so that was it. That was when all the studios then started. And there are a group of people, and we always, you know, we find each other. We're on LinkedIn. We were part of that core team that transitioned that, and we know each other that way, and we respect each other that way. Um, it's people from Apple, it's people from Microsoft, Xbox, it's people from Sony, PlayStation, uh, Amazon came into the business. Um, 
And, and we all remember each other from this, like this, these churning years. So, so that was a big one. So I, I was on that team and we watched a group when I was at Warner grow from eight people to over 200, it became worldwide, you know, $50 million grew to half a billion dollars. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it was, it was fantastic. I, um, I left Warner in 2000 and, uh, and 14 and, and went on the distribution side and I saw there was a really big need for it. And that was because devices were changing, regulations were changing, distribution was everything. It was getting product to market. That was all that mattered. Um, so I'll talk about that and kind of where I went, but Premier is, is a distribution company. So I, I went from one distribution company to another. We are a, we're a full scale worldwide uh, media services company. We sit between the content owners and the platforms. So I sit between, let's say a studio like Warner um, and a platform such as Apple or Tubi or um, Google Play or anywhere that you can watch something. Even connected TVs today have become uh, a destination for distribution. Um, I run sales and marketing. Um, it's called growth on our team and we, we drive the growth of the company. That's right. So your new role is changing and evolving. And I know I'm sure you have a lot of people that are, that are under you while also you're responsible for the future growth mm -hmm. of the company. Um, what's a day-to-day -day like procedures for you and, and what are you doing on, on a day-to-day -day basis? I can imagine it's it's a lot and you have to organize and figure out where you're um, going to be spending a lot of your time and your energy and delegating and trusting people and things are moving so quickly. I mean, yeah. it's hire us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you ask my boss, he'd be like, deals, 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 get the deals. Um, and, and I do a lot of that. I work a lot on deals. We are, um, you know, we, we, we look for companies that need the support of ours and and we do something that's very unique we do it we do very well on, on volume level so we'll take big libraries of content and we uh we manage them media services is about packaging and packaging is about putting things together and then bringing them to market if you ask anyone hey you know how a movie gets to netflix or you know how a movie gets to um tubi or or pluto tv or all these services out there and they just think they're sent, like they're sent from the, the company that makes them to the company that distributes them. But there's always someone in between. There has to be. Um, and, and there's something called components. And every film has multiple components. And those components are um, the assets, the metadata, the language. It's like a puzzle piece. And depending how far those, those packages go in the world, those puzzle pieces get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're the company that actually, you know, we collect them, we manage them, we QC them, um, we edit them, we put them together. And the end result is a, is a beautiful piece of content that we as consumers get to watch. And not that I want to make this even more complicated <laughs> for all of us trying to understand probably your world on a daily basis. Um, but AI is something that we've heard in the news for the past less than a year, I would say, um, yeah, wrongly. And a lot of it has to do with the characters in the movies that are obviously part of your whole, um, you know, making sure that the, the content that they're in is perfect. So, um, I don't know, kind of connect the dots for us. I mean, I'm trying, I'm thinking to myself, so do they make money every time you change the, a movie over from, you know, X to digital? Um, do you not know any about anything about that or, yeah. um, how is AI impacting you guys yeah i'll start with um kind of movies transitioning and and there's two things to to explain my business runs uh, on on two very large kind of economic standpoints production and distribution those are the two very you know those are the two large components of, of entertainment the production is the development the creation the filming um and then everything goes, and then there's post-production. So production, post-production, post-production puts it all together. And then there's distribution. And distribution is sales. Um, it's the delivery. It's all the after, after the fact, we call it. So those are the two areas. Um, you know, we're hoping that AI is going to support both sides of that. 
And when I say support, I mean support. I don't mean overtake. I don't mean um, do anything that's going to compromise. Uh, you know, we live in a world of technology. Things happen all the time. We we have a hard time holding on to everything. So it's probably going to do that. So there's going to be businesses that are going to swirl up that will, you know, support that. Um, from a production standpoint, yeah, I mean the the writers and the um, and the, um, the the screen actors uh, strikes that recently happened. A lot of it was around AI. Like, how do you protect your rights? How do you protect um, you as a as a writer from from kind of supporting the the job that you do? And and how do you as a as an actor kind of protect your um, you know, your personal being, um, there's, there's people are creating characters today, like, you know, characters that, that are not real. Uh, so it, it's going to be a challenge. I think what's going to happen out of AI is that we're just going to, we're going to develop more companies, which is great for the working market. I mean, there's just a lot that will come out of it. Um, will it support things? I think it's going to help us in some ways, and it's not going to help us in others, or it's going to hurt us. Um, but just like technology created work, so will the components of technology. So that is AI. Can you just elaborate that on that just a little bit, just to give us some insider people who are watching, you know, you never know what, um, what youngsters they might have and can influence them to go into certain programs, even at URI to get the jobs yeah. that you're, you're, you already know are going to be there. What, what yeah. So, so here's a great example. When I graduated, it was all about big business mass market, blue chip, everyone wanted to work for, you know, IBM. And I mean, I worked for Warner. I had friends who worked for Ralph Lauren, like big companies, small companies were more like mom and pop. Today, we live in a different world. Today, we live in worlds of startups. We live in worlds of where, where individuals can kind of create their own. They can, they can develop from the ground up. And, and that's because of technology, because technology can, can, introduce us to things quicker, can introduce us to people, places, things that we never knew existed. Um, and that's that's kind of the beauty of today is the number of companies that, that exist versus what was there when I graduated um, was very, very different. It was a very different world. So, you know, small companies uh, today that actually can become very big quicker than, you um, than the traditionals um, are are out there, sure. So certain jobs they should be looking for, just in tech in general. Oh boy, tech. I mean, tech is what is tech anymore? Tech is the norm. Everyone who's who's going into something will be tech related. I mean, I work in something called that's called ent tech, which is entertainment technology. There's fintech, which is financial technology. There is, you know, there's medical technology. There's there's all these. I think today everything is pretty much tech based of some sort, except for the things that we, you know, we think are, are, are more, um, uh, you know, emotional, spiritual, stuff like that, but they've got technology components to it as well. I was going to say the, some of the liberal arts majors might want to take some electives in tech, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't say, I don't say focus on it if that's not your thing. Cause it might not be, you know, my sister's an author and, um, she started her career, uh, you know, as a, as a writing books. So she, you know, yeah, she wrote on a computer. She, you're, um, now she's running. It's interesting. You know, she's older than me. She's running a company that is pretty much just online, but she gathers women in groups. So she took the core of her business, which was a topic of something. And then she knew that she could take this very specific topic um, and the, it, it's called motherless daughters. It's for women who have lost their mothers. My sister is Hope Edelman, a New York Times bestselling writing book author. Um, just a little plug to her because she's so fantastic and I love her so much, but she built this company and this company is based on tech. She had no insights to tech at all. That was not her thing, but she knew she had to and she really dug into it. And I'm so proud that everything she does today, I get emails from her. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Look at my sister go with like this fantastic marketing and everything she's doing. What um, sister? Her name is Hope Edelman. Hope. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful name. Yeah. So, um, she, you know, she took something that was so sort of, um, uh, you know, not top of her game. 
Yeah. And, um, and really created something with other people. She asked for help and she got it. So I guess that's another tip too. That, that sure. Um, yeah. With, um, uh, a lot of your job, Michelle, too, um, obviously it comes very natural because uh, look at your passion just to spread the word and share about the, the, the workings of your sister, about what you've yeah. done, about your mentor that you were mentioning to us earlier who, who passed yeah. uh, Apology. I'm so sorry about that as well. Yeah, you know, very special to you. But um, but this passion that comes from wanting to connect with all these people and to learn from them and to keep going, there's like a sales and marketing like you know kind of chip inside of you. What are some tips that you would give to people because you need those skills no matter what major you're doing or have done or job that you're in or job that you're you want to get in the future or yeah in general being you know yourself every day. What would you yeah. say yourself? great tips that, that, that you have. So I wrote, I wrote these down. I thought that was kind of, that's really, that is the tipping point of everything. Um, the number one thing is take care of yourself, take care of yourself, um, emotionally, physically, intellectually, you must take care of yourself. A lot of times, um, we go into work and we lose ourselves. We feel like we have to become a cog in the machine. And, you know, we come home from work, although today we work at home, you're exhausted, you've, you've got a family, you don't give them enough time. I also say, take care of your family, take care of your team. Um, I have a great team. I have people that are, that are just really, really um, good hearted people. They're smart. I hired them because I knew they were capable of doing the job, but I also wanted to be around them. I wanted to engage with them every day because that's what I do. I'm, I'm with them every single day. We become almost like a found family in, in the work that we do. Um, uh, the team that I run, ha we have a call every, every Wednesday at 10 AM. And it's almost like our little gathering. Now it's a, it's a sales, we call it the pipeline call. It's there's work going on there, but it's the little gathering of everyone. We get to kind of just talk about work, but also um, really show our personalities and our support of each other. That's another thing. So, so let me back up a second. So when I say take care of yourself, I mean, don't make work important, but don't make work everything you do. There's a lot of people that do that. They feel that, you know, by giving it their all, they're going to strive to the top and, and you will do well, but if you're not there emotionally, even physically, sometimes people work so hard, they get sick. And, and I want to tell you that I'm someone who did that. Um, I worked so hard. I, I never looked up. Now I had a, a great fulfilling career, but I still have one today and I take care of myself. Uh, and you have to, because people do get sick in this industry. Um, Warner in particular, uh, we were a thriving group. I mean, we were at this, as I mentioned, this precipice of like, transitioning medias. And, um, but I can tell you right now, I remember a lot of people just like getting sick and not just getting a cold or getting, but getting diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never really think about it, but we were, we were some of the hardest workers that were out there. And, and some people really took it to heart. And I say heart. Um, so there were some unfortunate things that happened. So, so take care of yourself. Never forget that. Um, take care of yourself emotionally. You know, we're dealing with so many different things today. I'm, I read more and more about, you know, the emotional welfare of, of kids and they're the future of, they're the future. And we have to take care of them. We have to teach them how to take care of themselves emotionally, but also take care of yourself intellectually. Like don't give up what you have. Um, remember, your, you know, everything that you've been taught, everything that school taught me, everything my parents taught me, everything I taught myself, like that's yours. You own that. And when you leave a company, you still have that. Uh, sometimes people give themselves to the companies they work for. And when they leave, they fall apart. But two things I can tell you, everything you did there, you own. And, and, you know, your welfare, your being, your, your intellectual capability, that's yours. It's nobody else's. Take it somewhere else and go somewhere they're going to appreciate you. I love it. Well, thank you too for, 
for taking the time before meeting up again to just kind of write down those notes like you said you, you, you did and um we you know you're so busy and it's just so accomplished and um you know knowing that you came into uri and you know not the strongest michelle and here you are today and yeah. who- Congratulations. When you Google you, you see so many, you know, awards that you've gotten even recently, oh, just thank you. Um, so that's really special for us to in- include you in this. And I know it's been fun for me and I don't know if anybody's left any questions to ask you, Michelle, but I, I believe we do have some time left if, um, if anybody does want to, to inquire. Sure. I'd love to answer questions and I'm also available if anyone, you know, you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or you want to do a, a check-in, a coffee talk or something, I'd be more than happy. Um, both alumni and students, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone um, about career, about just life. Like let's, let's connect. And I know you mean that we had yeah. such oh, for sure. that in before and you um, you would you would be wonderful to to connect with anybody who's who's trying to um, you know figure out their own path and their own journey themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, Kira, I'll turn it over to you to let us know if there's any other questions that anybody maybe chimed in to ask you, Michelle. And um, I believe people are are here from all over the coast, so different hours of the day. Maybe some are here for lunch. Maybe after breakfast. Yes, I do want to remind everyone that there is a Q&A function available within this webinar. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Michelle today, please submit that question in the Q&A function. Megan is happy to review those and pose those questions to Michelle if anyone has anything that they would like to add. And it does appear that there was one submission just now. Um, Let's see. Someone said that they logged in because they would love to hear your take on the modern landscape of social media for public information and communication. That's a good oh one. boy, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. You know, uh, whew. social media is exactly what it says. It's social. Um, so it's it's becoming this outlet now. I mean, and and it's it's so beyond. There are so many platforms today. There's so much information, and the problem, the good part about it is that listen, we use social media for for tons of reasons. Um, personally, I use it for connection. I use it to to keep myself connected. Um, I do use it for information. I find myself kind of. Um, engaged in what's going on. I try to keep a very, very um, uh, decent perspective, I want to say, because there's too much out there and there's a lot of false information. From a work standpoint, we use it a lot because again, it's it's reach, it's frequency, it's the ability to, to, to get the message out there. It's what we use for marketing today. Um, but from a public standpoint, I, you know, I always warn people years ago. And I'll tell you, this is, this is how I can tell that the things have changed so drastically. Uh, Social media. I was a huge fan when, when, when I was at Warner, I remember we were doing amazing things with social media. The company actually supported us in, in, um, in these very unique um, kind of uh, testing grounds. And we would do a lot of um, groups where we were developing new things or like these development groups. And it was all around social because it was brand new and we're using it for, for powerful ways. Uh, So I was very excited about it. And the people I was working with were about supporting it. And we were trying to do everything we can today. I'm a little bit more cautious. Um, I feel like uh, we, we, we have to take everything for granted. Um, I have moments where I just stay, stay off social media and I get back in touch with myself. That's when I say, take care of yourself. Uh, it, it means that as well, because there are so many things that um, it's it's doing that's great, but it's also doing some things that are that are that are hurting us. It's providing information that isn't accurate. It's hurting teenagers. It is it has gone to another another world. So, um, bit of caution on that one. Never thought I'd say that, but I mean that. I think everything you said, it, it added up for me. And, and I think it comes down to balance. Um, yeah. It comes with everything that you're, you're, you're saying, it sounds like um, not only have you advanced in your career so, so well, but also personally you've grown and um, sharing those fruits of your labor just 
um, you know, it, it solidifies it for a lot of us, but also yep. a good reminder. Um, and it, it also makes us feel okay to do it when, when somebody like you says it's important to, to take care of yeah. yourself. And also your, your professional work is going to, is, is going to go, um, be, be amazing because of that too. Um, because you were saying, you know, taking care of yourself and, and relax for, um, uh, R and R. Is there a particular streaming show that you like to watch, kick your feet back and uh, enjoy, speaking of everything that you do? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a total I'm a total um, binge watcher. Um, uh, Mrs. Maisel has been one of my one of my favorite. I just I don't know what it is. I think they just I, I love the the recreation of, you know, Upper West Side, New York, um, back in the 50s. I mean, talk about a, such a creative show. I'm also going to give a tout out for, for Ted Lasso. Um, I'll tell you why I love Ted Lasso, because there's meaning behind it. There's beautiful meaning behind it. And I, I love that. And when you're talking about kind of the way that, that I, I come across, I, I love um, the positive nature of it. It's just really fantastic. And it, it, I wish it didn't have as many curse words in it as it did. I, I would love for them to do a, a um, kind of like a PG 13 version of it. Cause I think kids need to watch it. Um, that's so sweet. And that actually is really is nicely into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which has to do with philanthropy. Um, yeah. That's not something that's easy to say, you know, just get into it, just start, you know, a little bit at a time, like, especially nowadays when there's not a lot of extra money to go around. Um, this young woman that I met uh, 10 years ago, she started a nonprofit um, while she was still um, high up there in her in her marketing uh, job. And now this is what she does full time. And it's remarkable to take that passion and that drive to want to help others and make it into a career. Not everybody can do that. But then I think it's like, well, how much is, is too little or like, what do you do? How do you start? And, um, you know, how do you feel confident in it too? The beauty, the beauty of philanthropy and nonprofit is that you can decide. That's what I love about it. Cause you can really go in inside into your heart and say, what is my gift? Meaning what do I love to do? And what do I love? Like, what are the things that just make me happy all the time? And you put those two together and um, it's sort of a, you know, Venn diagram of, um, <clears throat> you know, I love to grow things. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grower. That's why I run a growth group. Someone asked like, what do you love to do? I was, I was, I was actually interviewing someone and I was like, what do you love to do? And they're like, well, I really like doing marketing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what I mean. Like be beyond that, the underbelly of it what do you want to do with that marketing? Like, what is it about marketing? And I explained it. I said, I love when things grow because then I can see them happen. It's never like, oh, I want to, you know, I want to, you know, I want to sell things or I want to buy things or I want to, I want to know what people love to do where your, your mind just like, you know, that spark happens. Like, when do you feel that? And is it, communicating to a lot of people or is it um um you know so so i um i'll tell you where where my where my my love of is so i um i i love to grow things i love when people can say hey we just raised x number of dollars for things um you know i'm a breast cancer survivor so um that's a big thing for me i i like to support that because i i believe that like, wow, I, I survived and I want to help other women survive. And I don't want anyone to ever feel like they're at the last leg of their life. Um, I never got there and I never wanted to get there. And I, I, I don't think I ever will because I, I fought this and I won. Um, but I want to help other people. I really do. Um, so I'd say that's a, a big piece. Um, I also have a spot in my heart for animals. I just, I don't know, you know, some of us are people lovers. Some of us are animal lovers. I'm an animal lover. <laughs> I understand that <laughs> having a puppy myself, not talking turtles and lizards and yeah. all that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Puppies are the new babies. They say. Yeah, it's mine. Um, thank you for the approval, Michelle. So Michelle, I don't have access to the Q and a, not sure if you can see any of the questions that maybe popped up or if Kira wants to pop in as well. 
Yeah, I'm happy to go ahead and share those questions. We do have a couple more that popped up from some of our participants. One being, what do you consider the most effective modes of communication? And maybe you can approach that from a leadership perspective, personal, or even within your industry. The most effective modes of communication, meaning um, the dynamics between people in organizations or when you're speaking out to um, the audience, from a marketing perspective, there's, you know, there's internal communications, there's external communications. I'm going to say internal communications, voice to voice. Oh, goodness. Email is not used and meant for communication. It's, it's meant and used for documentation. I want, I want that, that message to go out there for everyone. Email is not about communication. It's about documentation. That's what it was originally built for. And that's what it should stay for. Um, you know, we're a big Slack company to kind of like those little notes and things. I'm okay with it. But when you can't put emotion behind things, it's really, really difficult. And you end up spending more time um, decoding than you do communicating. Um, I'm a, I'm a, as much as I don't like it, because I feel like, you know, my age, I, I probably practice more like a 20 year old in the way that I communicate. But, um, you know, texting is difficult. Uh, any sort of tech, tech communication, tech comms, um, uh, voice is the best. Even if you're texting, use the, use a voice text. Just tell someone how you're feeling, get, get the message, get out there. Um, that's a beautiful thing. I'm a big fan of that from communication and messaging to customers. You just got to go where they are and be very subtle. Um, we are, we're a, we're a, we're a group, you know, we sell a business to business service. Um, but I'll tell you something when I was, when I was at the, on the studio side and even now, because I'm, I'm still working and we're still acquiring films and, and licensing and, and distributing, um, we sold emotion. We sell emotion. That's what it was. We weren't selling movies. We were selling emotion. What is Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso is emotion. I sit down because I want to feel good or I want to just get out of the day and, and laugh and think. Entertainment is about emotion. We can never forget that. We go to the movies so that for two hours or three hours today, we can just sit, bring something into our brains and like, just think that's it. I love that. And, and it's very true. And I think everybody kind of feels that way. Emotion and sales, that's huge. And hearing it from you just solidifies it. Kira, you said a couple others that maybe wanted to get some questions answered by Michelle. I, I really yes, like that. I see the next question. Says that they run a breast cancer foundation. I want to talk to you. Have you speak about philanthropy as a career at some point? We need the next generation. We do. We need the next generation um, because they're, they are, um, they're, they're getting breast cancer. <laughs> uh, it's not just, our, it's not just our mothers and our grandmas anymore. It's, it's, you know, it's men, women, it's yes, we need the, we need the next generation. What was the question about? Um, I, I completely agree um, with what you're saying, but what was the question? Just to um, kind of I don't think it was a question. I think, I think it was yeah. more of a, and then, and then we're meeting. Someone is going to be in LA and, and we are meeting. Absolutely. Got it. A couple more questions. One is asking, what's the best way to follow up with you after today? And then yeah. secondarily, um, they would love to hear about how to curate social media and marketing in alignment with one's values and tech capacity. Okay, that's that's a much longer conversation, but I'm I'm going to um so if you are just beginning and you are, and you, you know, you have an idea, you want to align with your, your value, because it would start with your values and your tech capabilities. So there's a lot of ways to do this today that were much, that's much easier than, than where it used to be. So you can, you know, you can build a website, you can connect social media, you can have people, you know, um, set meetings through various things. You can sell stuff, you can, there's so many ways of doing it, um, but it takes a lot of time to investigate and to, um, and to put it all together. My, my recommendation to you is, is twofold. Number one, connect with people that already know how to do it. That's because it's gonna get you further faster. Um, 
have them help you, support you, learn from them, whether you're hiring people or you're working with people in a, in a role. Uh, help them support you um, so that you move a little faster. Because what, what's happening today is we're just in a very fast world. Things are moving super fast. If I look back from where I was, you know, working with, with Edward Blyer at Warner Brothers and him talking to me about television to where we are today, and now we're supporting these things called free ad supported television channels running up on feeds and like he like and it hasn't been that long you know i mean it's fast speaking of fast um your values are your values and and two things to know uh you have a personal life and you have a professional life when the two kind of come together it gets it gets interesting be be careful there just Note that you have two separate lives and your personal life doesn't have to become your professional life and your professional life, I, I guarantee you shouldn't become your personal life. So, so use the values that you have as a personal human being in your professional life, but just keep, keep the distance and know that you'll, you'll, you'll find the right, you'll get to the right path for sure. I hope I answered your question. There's a lot more that could be unpacked in that. It sounds and then, again, the theme is all about healthy boundaries. So no, that 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 sounded good to you, Michelle, over here. Kira, go ahead. Sorry. So sorry to interrupt. Uh, people are wondering what is the best way to connect or follow up with you after yeah. this conversation. Sure. Um, I'm going to say LinkedIn is the best. It's a it's a good way. And if I don't get back to you right away, just you know, give me a couple of days. But I will absolutely and and give me your email on on LinkedIn. Connect with me. Send me a note. Say I saw you on this panel and give me your email and I will I will follow up with you. Chances are I'll probably follow up with you through my um my personal Gmail, but I will follow up with you. Great. I think those are the only questions that I see at this time. Kira, thank you. I, I appreciate you that doing that. Um Michelle, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your lunch break. Um, or maybe it is actually your breakfast lunch break. But um, like, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um so just the last question, just to kind of leave you on, did you have a favorite memory? It could be anything from back at URI, your favorite dorm that you used to go visit or even yours or a famous uh, lunch place that you would go to. Maybe you would take a drive down to one of the beaches in Narragansett, but flood our memories with one of your memories from back in the late 80s. There are, I have to tell you, there are so many. Rhode Island was such a great school and I love seeing kind of where it's going today. I love seeing it on, um, you know, my my niece is uh, is now on her way to college. Or my last niece is on her way to college. And um, so I'm, I'm always, you know, helping her with things and and sort of looking at stuff. So, so social media is targeting me on colleges, which is so funny. And um, I'm seeing all these college acceptance kind of posts on Instagram and I'm seeing Rhode Island there and I'm all excited. And I just, um, so so seeing that from now is great. Back then, there are there are so many, you know, I again, I was a sorority girl. Um, that was my found family. The memories were there um, with my sisters and, and just kind of creating this great community. I, again, I, I came to school and I had lost my family and I, I found it at URI. I really did. I found my friends. I found, um, and to this day, uh, just the little texts I get from them, like my friend driving and, and snapshotting songs that we would sit on the floor of the Weldon dorm, um, writing down the lyrics to on our tape recorder, back and forth, back and forth, trying to get lyrics of songs because they didn't exist. Like little things like that that I remember. Um, from a from an education standpoint, uh, my my favorite professor who who passed was Dr. Agnes Duty. Five days, five days a week. Um, CMS 101 communication studies. I'll never forget that class. And she taught me how to speak and she taught me how to stand up and she taught me how to be confident. And that woman um, changed my uh, education. She changed my career focus. She changed my confidence. And um, yeah, 
to the and my heart goes out to her. I, I won an award at at URI. Um, a, um, I think it was like a alumni achievement, and um, she sat at my table, and it was one of the proudest moments I had having her there because I sat in her class in the '90s, and then in the 2000s she sat at at my table, and it was just amazing. And she was exactly the same. She did not change. And that woman is resting in power today. I can tell you. Did she have a, a long braid that was wrapped? Oh up? yes. Yeah. She no. drove a, she drove yeah. a, uh, a little two door Mercedes at 75 miles an hour out, <laughs> out of the university. Like, a uh, yeah, you can't forget well, it. I know a, a lot of, a lot of people who, who are nodding and, um, and, can agree exactly with you. So um, yeah, yes, she was, a, she was a pillar of the university. I'll never the I'll never forget the first day I got in her class and I saw her and I was like, wow, this this is a professor, and I think this woman is gonna do something and change my life, and she did. Wow, wow, what a lovely way to to end our our chat, Michelle. Thank you for your time, and thanks, Kira, for organizing everything. Um, and you know, of, of course, thank you to Mary O'Sullivan and, and, and everybody at URI who put this together. Yeah, I, I want to thank everyone here just quickly, let you know, um, this is your time too. And you, and you dedicated your time for me. And I really want to thank you. That was, that was amazing. Um, I, I really hope that I gave to this group what they were looking for. Please reach out to me. Um, you're, you're on a great path and enjoy it. Just remember to enjoy it. Well, thank you both for this really great conversation. And to those of you, to echo Michelle's comments, to those of you that joined us today for the webinar, thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to join us. In the coming days, you will receive a brief survey about this program. We would really appreciate it if you would complete the survey and share your thoughts on today's program so that we can bring you more in this Women in Leadership Speaker Series. So with that, have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you soon.